Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. I'm Julie, Chief Growth Officer at DBF. It's my pleasure to introduce our host for today, Camille Weisenberg. A scholar of the Architectural Association in London, Camille is an award-winning designer and entrepreneur. He cut his teeth as a young architect working with the Hadid and Wilkinson I Architect, before later founding Weisenberg, a Singapore-based design studio. Today, Camille is working full-time as a co-founder and CEO of DPF, a Singapore-based startup developing the world's most user-friendly platform for zero-emission buildings. Welcome, Camille. Thank you, Julie, for the kind introduction. <laughs> On behalf of the team at DPF, I would like to, thank, <laughs> to extend a huge welcome to everyone for being part of today's Building Carbon 2020. For us, it's a super exciting event to bring a diverse community together and to share our stories, wisdom, and inspire each other as we engage climate breakdown in the building industry from different perspectives. So why are we here? And why is DBF hosting this event? Well, since we started DBF, our mission has been to create a user-friendly platform to drive more sustainable building projects. Recently, we made a huge leap forward with our friendly friends at Karamba 3D in Austria and the Singapore Supercomputing Center. Together, we worked on an early stage carbon tool to compute trade-offs between different structural design alternatives with respect to carbon impact and cost. The idea here is to help teams and clients to consider more planet-friendly materials from day one and compare them in real time. But it's been an exciting collaboration. We realized we are just scratching the surface and more people need to be part of this discussion. While we have published a white paper on our website, this is bluefoam.com, we wondered how can we engage the building community in a big way on this topic? This is why we organized the Building Carbon 2020 to bring together people from across the building industry to learn how they are taking on the issue of embodied carbon and to open up new possibilities to connect and to work together to address the critical challenges of today and tomorrow. So now that I've said my piece, I let, let me return on to my co-founder, amazing Sajil. Today, today's MC, Sajil, will guide you through the discussion. Uh, a little bit about Sajil. So Sajil is obviously a genius co-founder and it's been a fantastic joy to work with him in the last five years. He's also a researcher and educator, working at the intersection of software, materials, and cities. He has a broad experience, and before joining DBF full-time as CTO and co-founder, Sajil sharpened his skills working as a founder professor at the DIDI in Dubai. Prior to that, he has been a principal investigator with Digital Manufacturing and Design Center in Singapore at SU3. As a researcher, with the MIT Digital Structures Group and the MIT Sensible City Lab. Sajil, it's great to have you hosting our summit today and it's been fantastic working with you. Thanks for the amazing intro, Camille. It's a real pleasure to be today's MC uh, of today's Petra Kucha event. I think it will be a lot of fun and also a very effective event, so let's get started. So my job today is just to guide everyone through the event. We, we've organized three panels with international experts um, using the Petra Kucha format. And the three topics, the first is looking at defining the car building carbon event agenda. The second panel explores the theme of disrupting building carbon through entrepreneurship. And the third panel explores the theme of building carbon, a call to action. And so, uh, like I said, today, to make things interesting, we're using uh, Petra Kucha style presentation. And so these are, if you've never heard of what a Petra Kucha is here are the rules of engagement. So Petra Kucha means chit chat in Japanese. It's a rapid fire format. So each speaker gets 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide for a total of six minutes and 40 seconds. The slides automatically advance uh, to make things really interesting. And they're shaped around a powerful idea or story. So it's a really effective format for sharing ideas. Um, so with that, let's get started with our first panel. Um, so now I'll, I'll introduce our first group of panelists. Our first panelist is Stacy Smedley, who's the 
Executive Director of Building Transparency. Stacy has 18 years of experience in architecture and construction, and her resume includes the very first lead for homes platinum certified project in Washington state and the first project in the world to be certified under the living building version 2.0 center standards. Before her role as an executive director at building transparency, Stacy served as a sustainability director at Skanska where she led sustainable initiatives and was a subject matter expert in carbon emissions associated with buildings and construction. Today, Stacy leads efforts to provide open access to data, tools to address embodied carbon Carbon's role in climate change. Welcome, Stacy. Our second panelist is Tolga Tutar, who is a sustainability director in Skanska, USA. Tolga is an architectural engineer with 15 years of experience in engineering and consulting, focusing on sustainable design, energy efficiency, and project management. At Skanska, Tolga works on their green building projects, carbon re reporting, and sustainability initiatives. Prior to joining, he worked for leading organizations such as ARAP. Cadmus, Davis, HOK, Navigant, Rocky Mountain Institute on a range of topics, including sustainability, energy efficiency, and project management. Togo holds a Master of Science in Architectural Engineering from Penn State and a Master of Science in Building Engineering from Polytechnic University of Milan. Welcome, Togo. Our third panel is Michael Drobnik, who's a Design Technology Lead at Herzog & Demeron in Basel. Michael leads the multidisciplinary and global design technologies team at Herzog and Demeron. His team supports a range of projects with digital methods and tools ranging from BIM, computational design, visuals, animations, and analog digital workshop. Over the years, Michael and his team have brought research initiatives like extended reality, custom early stage design tools, and sustainability and performance simulations into daily practice. Michael received his architectural degree from the Faculty of Architecture and Civil Engineering at TH Karlsruhe, Germany. And previously, Michael taught at the Chair for Architectural Informatics at the TU Munich, TU Munich in the field of computational design. Welcome, Michael. Finally, uh, our final panelist is Andrew Frontini, who's a design director and principal at Perkins and Will, Toronto. Andrew is, a, is passionate about the design of published buildings where communities form and flourish. Andrew's designs have been widely published and are the recipients of regional, national, and international awards. Welcome, Andrew. And so thank you, everyone, for being part of our panel today. And let's, let's get it started with Stacey. So Stacey, you can take it away. Great. Here goes nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm going to I'm just going to start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Stacy Smedley. I'm the executive director of Building Transparency, a nonprofit whose mission is to provide the open access data and tools necessary to account for embodied carbon emissions. And today, I'm here to talk briefly about their role in climate change and climate action. Typically, when we talk about things like hurricanes, droughts, extreme heat, and forest fires, we call these events natural disasters. But actually, the extreme events we are beginning to experience today are man-made disasters caused by us, caused largely by how we consume things. If you think about it, we consume all sorts of things. We consume energy to heat, cool, and light our buildings. We consume gasoline to fuel our cars and the airplanes that transport us around the world. And we make and consume all sorts of other things from single-use plastic water bottles or other plastics to concrete and steel that we use to construct our buildings. And if we think about the making of all of these things, we start to realize that everything that we need to live our daily lives actually emits a great deal of CO2 into the atmosphere and is a direct contributor to the 1.2 degrees of warming that we've already experienced and the trajectory we, we are on to surpass 0.5 degrees in our lifetime. And I think that was more than 20 seconds, but that, there we go. <laughs> um, it's important that we understand um, where we are in this trajectory. So if we look at this slide, you're seeing now that we are approaching that 1.5 degrees. If we don't do everything we can to negate the emissions in our atmosphere today, uh, we're not going to get to zero in the time that we have left. So as we're beginning to account for these emissions, it's important we understand how uh, carbon emissions are currently accounted for within um, our human lives. And in the framework of scope one, two, and three emissions, 
it's only been recently that these supply chain emissions of what we purchase and, and what we consume have become a keen focus. These include things that we uh, purchase for uh, buildings and for making products. And now that we are beginning to report on these scope three emissions, uh, we are seeing that these purchase supply chain emissions, these embodied carbon emissions of making everything that we procure, is actually over 80% and in many cases, over 90% of a company's total emissions spent on an annual basis. Now putting this into the context of buildings, we know that buildings contribute almost 40% of global CO2 emissions, with over 10% of those emissions being the embodied carbon emissions of all of the materials and construction activities it takes to build our built environment and infrastructure. If we begin to visualize those embodied carbon emissions, we can start to make them tangible. So I want you to think about uh, the manufacturing of a project, a product from the extraction of the raw ingredients to the transport of the materials to a manufacturing facility, turning materials into products, transporting them to a construction site, installing them to make a building. And if we visualize all that CO2, we can actually start to focus on reducing it. So I've dug into these emissions. I've begun to use this saying to describe the work. Embodied carbon is like an onion. You peel it back one layer at a time and sometimes you do weave. This accounting is hard, it's not easy, and there are many layers to it. We all need to just dig in and get started, put on those goggles and start to peel back the layers. We're at a place where we can begin to look at carbon intensity of products just like cost, where we can take the kilogram of CO2 per unit of material and assess products to find the lowest carbon options. And if we do just that, manufacturers across the construction sector of high emitting materials like steel and concrete, for instance, begin to see the need to innovate and decarbonize to be competitive. Now, the data we need, those carbon intensity values, live in third-party verified environmental product declarations, or EPDs, which are essentially environmental nutrition labels for building materials. Just like looking at nutrition labels when you're on a low-carb diet, we can now look at EPDs and put the construction sector on a low-carbon diet. If we all begin to use this data and leverage it to make low carbon design and procurement decisions, we can as a sector truly begin to move the needle on reducing the carbon footprint of the building industry. We need access to the data and the tools to do all of that work. At Building Transparency, we have provided a tool called EC3 to help with this. EC3 is a free open access tool managed by the nonprofit that has digitized 100,000 EPDs into a free open access database, provided that data through an API for anyone to use, and provided a free tool that enables the searching and comparison of product and project level um, accounting of embodied carbon emissions. The tool is supported and informed by a cross-section of industry from owners, contractors, architects, engineers, manufacturers, and other key stakeholders which we're very proud of because embodied carbon accounting and reduction is a team sport that takes everyone across the value chain of construction. Since the tool's public launch in 2019, the growth of users of the tool has surpassed 28,000 and the number of EPDs being produced and included in EC3's database continues to grow exponentially and globally as more people access, ask for this data and act on it. There is great momentum right now in the private sector to require EPDs and embodied carbon accounting to meet their climate targets and tackle the scope three emissions that account for most of their footprint. Every company on this screen has zero carbon targets by 2030, 2040, 2045, and they include the scope three emissions of everything they purchase and procure, and that includes what they use to make their buildings. At the same time, we are also seeing policy on the public side being proposed and implemented at all scales of government, including city, state and country level policies in the US. Bike lane policies have been implemented that require EBTs at time of procurement, and there are now incentives in place to incentivize the lowest carbon option to be selected at time of bid. As we continue to see this grow, uh, we have seen really good results. So in Washington state where EBTs have been available and these procurement policies have been in place in the private sector, we've seen an almost 20% reduction in concrete emissions on average from the top three suppliers. 20% in just three, actually two years. If we think about applying that 20% of emissions reduction to concrete globally, we can start to understand what this impact really looks like. Imagine taking uh, millions of cars off the road the year or the equivalent of one trillion trees a carbon sequestration for a year. That's what would happen if we all just took 20%, uh, a 20% cut of emissions for concrete today, and it's possible. 
So my last question really to end my brief 20 by 20 is, is what's stopping you? What's stopping you from putting on those goggles, digging into these emissions and taking action? We have the data, we do have the tools now, and now it's just time to do the work. Thank you. Okay, let's put on the goggles. As Stace <laughs> underlined, uh, embedded carbon emissions associated with material production, transportation, construction, and end-of-life scenarios are critical. And general contractors like Skanska can make a big impact in addressing and reducing these emissions significantly in build environments. Um, embodied carbon is expected to be responsible for almost half of total new construction emissions until 2050. And as general contractors, we are in construction business that we would like to grow, but we have the ability and responsibility to provide solutions to minimize the climate impact of the structures that we build. While we are expected to be doubling the amount of building floor space in the world in the next 35 years, which is equivalent to building an entire new New York City every 35 days, um, what are the key strategies that general contractors can support or lead to address embedded carbon in the structures and the buildings? Well, many low cost, high impact strategies to reduce embedded carbon require coordination with all key stakeholders early in the project. Contractors' early involvement in this process allows them to provide very valuable feedback regarding procurement, cost, material carbon data, technical feasibility, and more. Then, setting net zero embodied carbon targets early in a project is another crucial step to maximize reductions and also minimize costs. Contractors' feedback um, early in this process can really help uh, in set, setting up these baselines and embodied carbon reduction targets. Uh, for the project. And to tackle embodied carbon, uh, well, reusing buildings is very important. In a recent study we conducted, we have found that when an average performing existing building is demolished and a new energy efficient building is constructed, it takes between 10 to 80 years for the new building to overcome its construction related emissions through efficient operations. And whenever possible, reusing materials instead of purchasing new products is another great strategy. In our Canada building project, one of the most sustainable buildings on the planet now, our team achieved net positive waste by salvaging and reusing more materials destined to landfills than the amount of waste we generated on site. And considering most of the embodied carbon is typically in the structural system, contractors should work closely with the structural designers and look for ways to achieve maximum efficiency on structural components to reduce the quantities of materials. This process can be expanded to all materials after addressing the big ticket items. And as Stace mentioned, environmental product declarations or EPDs are great tools telling the life cycle impact story of a product. Project teams can choose low carbon alternatives based on EPDs and requiring EPDs in specifications will further help contractors to ensure that the necessary carbon disclosure is provided during procurement. Now we have the optimized material quantities and material specific carbon data in hand. Contractors can play an important role with key milestones in creating and refining project embedded carbon estimates alongside cost data by utilizing tools like embedded carbon in construction calculator EC3. And for products that typically have very high embedded carbon footprints such as asphalt, concrete and steel, thoughtful use is essential. It's important for contractors and design team to work together, to limit such materials and opt for lower carbon alternatives as applicable. When we talk about concrete, well, to reduce the carbon intensity of concrete, it is important to reduce the amount of cement in the mix because it's responsible for 8% of all global CO2 emissions. And contractors should work closely with structural engineers to design low carbon concrete mixes by implementing innovative solutions. Then next step might be using agricultural products such as timber, cork, or hemp insulation that sequester carbon, which is also crucial. In our Portland Airport project, we are building a nine acre lifespan mass timber roofing system, which is regionally and sustainable sourced and reduces the embodied carbon footprint of the project significantly. Next, carbon smart procurement is essential. We can enforce subcontractor bids to contain both the quantity 
cost and carbon data, which enables the best to be compared with each other and evaluated against the initial carbon targets for the project, which can be done easily with EC3. And while talking about procurement of low carbon materials, we always get the question about the cost premium. In a recent study we published, we found that the embedded carbon footprint for most of the projects can be reduced 30 to 46% with minimal cost premiums, obviously depending on the market conditions. And then as contractors in construction phase, it is essential for us to minimize transportation carbon emissions, avoiding air freight and using ocean freight for international source materials or choosing rail transport in lieu of tracking can make a big impact to reduce the embedded carbon footprint of your project. Also in construction phase, um, it is important to address construction site carbon emissions. Contractors can utilize all electric or hybrid equipment to reduce dependency for fossil fuels and also evaluate the on-site or off-site renewable energy options for carbon-free energy generation. Then the emissions due to um, deconstruction and disposal of building materials is part of the embodied carbon story. Contractors should prevent and minimize waste generation, prefabrication, on-site waste separation, uh, using modular assemblies that are designed for deconstruction are some of the strategies to reduce construction and demolition waste. Then after utilizing all the feasible strategies to actively reduce carbon on-site, well, carbon offsets might be considered to achieve net zero. Offsets compensate for the remaining emissions by reducing them elsewhere through renewable energy or forestation programs, for example. But it's key to use offsets as last resort. Overall, well, achieving net zero carbon emissions is feasible via collaboration, setting ambitious targets, and innovation in products, tools, and processes. And general contractors have a key role to play in this process. As a construction company with net zero carbon emissions goal by 2045, I hope you can join us on our journey. Thank you very much. Let's let's go. Great. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. So let's let's have a small journey, basically. So what does it mean net zero, and what does it mean as like a design technology leader uh, to talk about it? So we have to understand what kind of impact it has on design and what are the right technologies we have to choose and maybe to create in a way. So design technology means for us um, that we support projects with appropriate methods, tools, and that we as well do inventions in a way, figure out what are the appropriate new processes that we can Im embed in our design pro projects, basically. And when we look at first at what we did in a way in the past um, from a design strategy perspective, I mean, what, what interests us, like repurposing a, a, a building like like this, this, let's say, relic in a way, that's definitely something that's interesting, not only from a CO2, but as well from a, from a historical point of view. But sometimes we have as well to think about what is the function of a project in a way, what's the typology? A hospital like that one in, in Zurich, a children's hospital, basically is all about, let's say, having a sustainable and flexible structure that, that can grow and change over time. So with that, basically, we have to think about what are appropriate material systems and maybe think about as well how can we design a building together with the engineers that is as flexible can take loads but maybe it reduces weight in the slabs in a way that we combine it with with prefab uh, um, wooden structures in a way that that we have an effective building in a way and sometimes as architects we're as well interested in the material so when you look at that project that is a herb cutting center for for a swiss candy uh, production uh, facilities. Clay is really something that is very interesting mm, as, as a performance for the building, but as well as a material and uh, aesthetical reasons. And one of the projects that basically triggered um, from the design and from the technology side a lot in, in the office is the uh, Hortus project. So from Latin, the garden, uh, from the uh, developer Sen out of Switzerland, it's the house of research technology, utopia and sustainability. And the interesting 
thing here is that it changed the way how the project was developed in a way uh, that not only normative uh, benchmarks were introduced, but as well the client in a way wanted us to, to undergo and even to reach as possible, let's say, uh, a, a very effective building in terms of here uh, building energy. But um, so in a way, this for that, you have to de develop strategies, obviously, you know, integrated PV panels, natural ventilation, um, how to bring in um, the biodiversity into the building. This is like what you what basically a sketch you would do normally as well in that project. But the, the real radical move here in a way is that it moves all already from day one to, let's say, a very refined level of detail in a way of what you think about. Like what is what is the material, how's the construction, how's the process? And you move between very coarse design in a way, like from a from a building to, to very detailed constructions at the same time. And then this this is like a close collaboration in a way about really figuring out what is the most performative systems that creates this architecture. So in a way, um we have to really be open and maybe change the way our design process is and at the same time the tools we use in a way from a design technology point of view so thinking about that we really um, have to be in a way uh, creative and find new ways of of how do we basically not only uh, um, let's say calculate that but as well um how we as well kind of uh, construct these things now materials like clay bringing that like turning it upside down that is like a prefab product in a way that you can bring on site that has this performative let's say adds that value to the project but the interesting thing where we now jump to the design technology part in a way is how do you fabricate that? And there the interesting thing is that robotic fabrication in a way opens up new possibilities for, for bringing again a material that would clay that is very manual in a way to another level that may be something that's, that is in a way mass constructible at least to a certain degree. And this is this is where we as well started building up our building analytics team in a way to to really have to provide that as a fundamental part of the design process that we from early on understand and provide the right tools in a way to simulate to understand in in architectural practice what does it mean, and there it's really it comes to our side as well. So where is the complexity? Can we really? when we calculate a building that maybe is 50 to 100 years is like a sequestration, can we take that into account? Is the formula right? Is the training set of an AI maybe right, basically? So it's really, there are a lot of complex questions and um, maybe we have to find simple solutions to, to, to be able in an early design phase to make really the right decisions. So it's not only about CO2, it's there are a lot of more things that we have to as well take into account uh, about biodiversity, really like uh, the pollution and all these things. And th therefore, we need to create simple tools for that, that an architect in the design process very easily can basically understand, navigate, make the right decisions. In a way. And therefore, the simplicity of, of that is like introducing the, the the learning process into that and very important point here is that we don't create black boxes in a way so we have to be transparent we have to understand we have to educate ourselves we have to share in a way so that's something like that format is let's say a great platform for each of us um, as we heard already before and I guess we'll hear, hear later and the the key is like collaboration. So time is running. So it's the decade that makes the most difference, like until 23. So we have to be open, share, and I think very be open all over the industries in a way. And uh, I'm I'm happy to, to be on the journey with you all together. Thanks a lot. All right. Our final speaker, Andrew, for the panel. Our society and our economy are addicted to building. And as architects, we're complicit in the, in the consequences of defaulting to a build more philosophy. In recent years, we've made enormous strides in building smarter, though those gains are dwarfed by the consequences of overbuilding. And here we're looking at a beaver dam, as you might be able to see. 
Um, beavers, like humans, uh, follow a build or die ethos. But their efforts are restricted to a couple of simple prototypes, which are held in balance with an, as an integral part of a complex web of life. And here we have a picture of a mountain range where there's this incredible hierarchy of information and scale, but it reads as one system. And I think there's probably even a beaver hiding in there somewhere. If we look at to um, this town, Hilltown in Calabria, it looks like a bit like the hill it sits on, and that's because it's made the same material. It reads as a system, parts of a whole, of its place and in sync with it. And its embodied carbon is theoretically very low as manual and animal labor were used to convert the immediate landscape into shelter for this town. When we look at Hong Kong, the modern metropolis, natural systems and formations are subsumed by architecture and infrastructure. And what is noticeable is that these buildings are made of things from all over the world and could actually be found anywhere in the world. They're all struggling to assert themselves, each one an edification of its builder's power, success, and prestige. And before I go into this idea of edification and de-edification, I do want to talk a bit about decarbonization. This is both and scenario, and we need to build less, build what we do build better. And our first impulse, it would seem, as a society, is to count our way out of this predicament. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, but it's not the only thing. Here we have a diagram um, that illustrates our design process, a set of very granular investigations and activities that we use to shape and drive operational <clears throat> and embodied carbon down. It's ambitious and aspirational and not all of our clients are ready for it, but with some of them, we're making really significant strides using this dual approach, this methodology. Here we have a render of the Northeast Scarborough Community Recreation Center in Toronto. It's currently in construction. And it's Canada's first net zero sports and recreation facility under the CAGBC net zero building framework. That's a particular, it's a standard focus is on operational carbon, a particular challenge when we're dealing with the heavy process loads of an aquatic center. Now to achieve this ambitious target, we walk the client through a stepped approach, beginning with passive strategies, a super compact massing, relying on an innovative stacking of the program, a passive house inspired design for the envelope, active systems focusing on electrification, heat recovery, energy, energy synergies between program, smart operations, and a huge focus on on-site renewables. But we didn't stop there, and we led our client through a detailed analysis targeting embodied carbon. The areas of greatest impact, as I've already been touched on, foundations, superstructure, building envelope allowed us to reduce carbon, embodied carbon by 40% against a baseline. We gave our client a menu of options that quantified premiums, payback, and planetary benefits. So as architects, we're getting good at the deep analysis around carbon and at mapping the decisions for our clients. In a way, I'd say we were moving towards being able to answer more consistently and systematically Buckminster Fuller's famous provocation to Norman Foster, where he asked him, how much does your building weigh? Less carbon, in a way, is less weight on the environment. Now, one way to de-edify society is to build less. And there's greater humility in taking what's existing, unloved and unused, and turning it into a hub of vitality and creativity. This former dairy factory in Atlanta supported a supports 100,000 square feet of space for culture and business startups. And the existing structure captured 5,000 tons of CO2 equivalents added biomass and habitat, which were returned to the site. The renewal of this brutalist office complex in Gatineau, Quebec, will achieve net zero operational carbon. By retaining the existing structure, we also avoided releasing the equivalent of 51,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. The site's complex history was retained as it was greened and reintegrated into its context. Now, in the next couple of slides, you'll see buildings we designed for a Canadian university. In both cases, we were asked to create an iconic gateway for the campus, an edification of this institution's values and prestige. And they are also edifications of contractual agreements, stating that a professor is entitled to an office with a window on any campus, one of three campuses that they teach at. The challenge is that many professors live in the core and have or never will use the offices in these buildings. And I wish I could say that such underutilization of embodied and operational resources is uncommon, but in my experience, it is not. And as we begin to count carbon as part of our regular design process, I can't help counting all of the underutilized space we've designed and continue to design. So perhaps it's time to ask different questions than those we traditionally put forward at the outset of a design. Traditionally, what do you want to build? What do you want it to cost? Where do you want to build it? How big does it need to be? What do you want it to say about you? 
And more recently, what are your energy and carbon reduction targets? Or how can we help you exceed those targets for the good of society? Now, would new questions lead us beyond the object or built system with its quantities and operations? Instead, help us all think about who is using the building, how often they use it, why they use it. We need to build judiciously with the greatest value in mind, moving from a what scenario towards uh, a who, when, and why. I would argue that value comes in supporting culture, the magic that happens when people come together in real space. Architects are being called upon to broaden their scopes of expertise all the time, and is counting carbon the only or best use of our talents and training in achieving these reduction targets? Can we tackle our responsibility to the global ecology from a different angle? Can we move away from designing premiated objects toward the more humble but rewarding tasks of supporting the occupation of space towards cultural, emotional, and physical well-being? We go from being designers of objects to cultural occupation strategists. Now, I'd say to do this, we need to ask different questions, such as what do you do? What is the culture surrounding what you do? Does it need a space? Do you have a space or spaces already that could serve your culture? If yes, then do they need to be modified? And if so, how? And then more importantly, could you actually share space or share space and time? Could we design you a schedule instead of a building? So can we use our soft skills as architects to get us all to kick our addiction to hard infrastructure? I'm not trying to talk us out of a job, but rather into a new way of thinking about our ultimate responsibility to house society in the most gracious and sustainable way possible. Build smart, build light, build less, Let's call that de-edification. Well, fantastic. Um, Andrew, you didn't, get, yeah, you didn't get your applause. <laughs> uh, we'll have to look into that. So uh, we have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, so maybe I, I, I see there's a question to Tolga um, and perhaps, uh, perhaps the other panelists can join in in addressing the question. So the question is, what are the current barriers for addressing embodied carbon from your perspective? Oh, sure. From um, contractors perspective, I guess, we are kind of go going through a learning curve similar to when the green building certifications like LEED uh, came into the market. So education, <laughs> the, such events is definitely a part of that. Uh, we have to share and learn more from each other. Um, and embodied carbon in comparison to um, operational carbon is a bit more complicated. So there's data availability and gaps, but we are uh, slowly closing that gaps and we will have better data set when everyone really like starts analyzing their projects and have more data available. And maybe the last one can be uh, the limited mandatory requirements in policies, building codes, and standards, but we are also making huge progress on that. So in the near future, hopefully this will be addressed as well. I think those are my top three barriers for now. Thanks, Olga. Okay, we have a question, um, perhaps Stacy uh, can answer, um, which is from Mustafa, who says, great job guys, quick one. Is what you're talking about applicable to all civil structures, roads, bridges, dams, boards, structures, et cetera, or only buildings? Maybe, uh, does anyone wanna jump on that question? I'm muted, but I would. Ah, okay. Andrew, why don't you go? I would just say yes. I mean, I think Tolga would be the best one to answer. But uh, you know, anything where that we're building, transporting goods, putting them together, and the, where there's a carbon impact in the materials, everything we build uh, and make is on, is really subject to the same set of rules and possibilities for reducing those embodied carbon footprints. Yeah, yeah, and civil structures have an even larger impact on buildings because of the amount of materials and like high. Um, highly carbon intensive materials, like again, concrete, steel, and asphalt. Great, maybe, maybe one more question uh, that comes from uh, Mohammed Kaduri. The question of cost uh, impose, does, does cost impose this revolutionary vision and technology 
And if so, how do we rebalance this indicator? Anyone feel free to jump in. Uh, well, I'd say this, uh, or I'm, uh, these are all unmuted, aren't I? You, you yeah, can I can hear you. Unmuted. I can hear you. <laughs> oh, no, okay, great. I, I think that this is all about education because, uh, you know, obviously if you kept the building structure, you could save money. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you could be by recycling materials or reusing materials, you could actually save material costs, but there's just a, I think a, a lack of general understanding and, and we need to educate our clients. And then that takes a lot of work as to, to quantify the available materials, quantify their carbon, uh, embodied carbon, and then quantify, um, the cost savings or, or, or premium associated with keeping something as opposed to tearing it down, removing it and rebuilding it. And I think. We really need to accelerate the general education of our clients because the perceived cost premium is probably the biggest barrier um, to, to any of these initiatives. And as right. Tolga pointed out, it, in fact, it doesn't need to be that way. If you really get granular, you were, I think you said 1% for a 46% reduction in embodied carbon. That took a lot of counting, though, and a lot of analysis. And that information isn't. If you don't have it at your fingertips, you, you know, you're at a disadvantage when it comes to convincing a client uh, to do the right thing. So I think we need to get that. I think that's what this event is about, is sharing that kind of information and making sure that more people have, it, have that understanding and can share it with the people who have to spend money on these projects. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in organizing the event, a big, a big inspiration was just around the educational aspect and just to, to engage the community in a conversation. So that's perhaps... A great way to leave this panel. Um, thank you everyone for their questions and presentations and let's move to panel two. So now, now I'll just introduce our next batch of uh, speakers. And so our next panel focuses on accelerating the transition uh, through disruption. And so uh, our first speaker is Christina Carney, who's the director of product of Nexi Building Solutions, uh, which is one of Canada's unicorn startups and Christina has a decade of experience as a project architect and a team leader for high-rise development, institutional, adaptive reuse projects. She's passionate, passionate about fostering collaboration within interdisciplinary teams and empowering her clients to make thoughtful and data-driven decisions. This passion is now implied in the world of product to address the climate crisis by designing solutions that can scale. She's a graduate of the University of Waterloo is a licensed architect and has international experience in England, France, and Italy. She's currently serving as a council member with the Ontario Association of Architects. Welcome, Christina. Our second panelist is Dipika Raghu, who's a PhD researcher at ETH Zurich in Zurich. Dipika uh, works in the chair of circular engineering and architecture, and her interests lie at the intersection of technology, architecture, and innovation to help transition to a circular building economy. Her research explores the digitally aided circular city that can effectively manage building resources and reduce waste. She is currently working towards detecting materials and components in existing buildings using remote sensing and machine learning to identify where and when these materials will be available for reuse. Welcome to Pika. Our third panelist is Patrick Tofo, founder of Circular Structural Design in Berlin, Germany. Patrick is founder, founder of Tofo Engineering Consultants a structural engineering consultancy, professor of innovative structural design at Eindhoven University of Technology, where he focuses on resource efficient structural engineering and the relationship between structural design and sustainability. This covers lightweight, lightweight and adaptive structures, the reuse of existing buildings and components, as well as the application of innovative materials, such as smart materials and bio-based materials. Patrick studied civil engineering at the University of Stuttgart and began his career at Erup in London. Welcome, Patrick. Our fourth speaker is Florian Stitch, who's the lead of product decarbonization and material health at Gropius in Munich. Florian has 10 years of experience in sustainable construction with a strong focus on life cycle assessment, material health, and implementation of sustainability strategies in the value chain. He's responsible for the decarbonization strategy at Gropius, which focuses on product decarbonization and decarbonization at the organization level. In addition to his work at Gropius, Florian lectures sustainable construction at TH Rosenheim, where he teaches students about general sustainability topics in the construction sector, and also about the life cycle assessment of products. Welcome, Florian. And then the final speaker uh, in this panel is Camille, who we've already met. Uh, welcome again. Welcome back, Camille. Okay, Christina, are you ready to go? 
Already excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, right, here we go. All right, here it goes. <laughs> Panel two, here we go. Okay. So a few months ago, I was struck by this article that calls out architects for roles in climate change. At first, I found this a bit jarring because like most architects, I was drawn to the discipline because I wanted to have a positive impact. But despite good intentions, nearly half of the missions are directly related to buildings that we've designed over the years, as many panelists have already pointed out. Um, the tagline here suggests that data and modeling alone won't solve the problem, but the design culture itself needs to change. But what does that actually mean? What is it about our current culture that has got us into the situation? So from my perspective, to get at culture, that means that we need to get at how we think and talk about the issues, and that can really only be done at a systems level and then through events like this. I love this quote because it so clearly connects outcomes to organization. And I, well, while I believe in individual responsibility, I also recognize that we are products of the system. The statement helps me to be less judgmental about people as individuals and yet still name the things that are wrong about this world. And I think we can all be honest that there's plenty of things to criticize, as we've talked about. Uh, while our systems have been broken for quite some time, you know, I and my privilege didn't always see or experience it directly. But the added pressure of a global pandemic exposed the fragility of our just-in-time delivery, our addiction to cheap and convenient. Um, so, you know, we, we know that disruption was happening whether we like it or not, and while painful, has really started to inspire some change. The call to action has never been more urgent, and you don't need to look very far to see another hurricane, flood, or fire wreaking havoc. And we know that the way that we build is increasing carbon, which is changing climate and that that vicious cycle is continuing as we the increase of natural disasters are adding even more pressure to the uh, stretch construction industry, making it more difficult to build uh, quickly and affordably. So you may be familiar with the story of the two fish swimming along, asked by an older fish, how is the water? Uh, they both look to each other and ask, what's water? And the point of this little narrative is that it, it, we can't always see our situation until we get out of it. Uh, so my experience so far with Nexi has been that, just an opportunity to change my perspective and to see things differently leaving traditional practice. So taking on a new mental model has been a way for me to hold on to hope. Um, and if every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets, then neither the system nor the results are inevitable. Uh, we can continue to look at problems with this linear A to B thinking, or we can stop adopting new ways of thinking uh, that are more relational and cyclical and the paradigm. And this is already happening, as we hear today, uh, understanding how uh, things like HVAC systems contribute to emissions. We're already seeing a significant decline in operational emissions. Uh, the next frontier, has, as we've talked about, is embodied carbon, uh, which we at Nexi are tackling throughout our value chain, um, from our materials to process, to thinking about how we design for disassembly. And at the first, um, we're tackling the industry challenges at the scale of the building envelope. Anyone designing energy efficient buildings understand that this is the first line of defense. Um, the envelope as it's normally built has many challenges to overcome, such as coordination, ownership of trades, detailing, all of which we've tried to assemble or address through our prefabricated panels. And we leverage the inherent benefits of offsite construction of speed, scale and quality. And what makes them different is that we're cast using a low carbon next site, which is our polymer concrete that eliminates Portland cement. Uh, and is able to bond to EPS without adhesives, creating a non-toxic, highly efficient pa panel that can be used on many building types. This is an example of a housing prototype that's planned for the rebuild of indigenous community who were devastated following forest fires in Linton, BC in the summer of 2021. Our next seat panels are being used for the walls and roof for standard housing units and combined with CLT for a low carbon and durable solution. Uh, so this is a great example of uh, dealing with the effects of climate change. Here's another example of a showroom model that is being taken apart to be reassembled for a client as a laneway house on Vancouver Island. Beyond addressing the carbon of the product itself, we're looking to find a reliable method to reuse our panels at end of life to diverse way away from landfills. Uh, this next example is uh, the Courtyard Marriott. It's about to be up here. Uh, largest project to date. Uh, we've provided all the planning panels for a nine-story hotel. And this project is a great example because it's so typical of many multi-story buildings across the world that are optimized for their layouts and hence have a lot of repetition, but still often use bespoke design and construction to address the enclosure. So there's a lot of opportunities here to leverage the constraint of that form to, to do something more efficient. Uh, beyond our envelope products, we're also le leveraging partnerships with the other industry leaders to create turnkey net zero buildings. This way we can serve a market that is finally accepting the problem at hand, but often lacks solutions or know how to address it. 
Uh, so this store of the future uh, uses your panel as a platform that can integrate other technologies for full effect. Uh, systems thinking is a discipline for seeing holes. It is a framework for seeing interrelationships rather than things, seeing patterns of change rather than static snapshots. Uh, the construction industry has not increased capacity partly because it's not leveraged systems thinking. Instead, it considers the parts, the elements of a spec, specific trade, a uh, building isolated from its context. Uh, because every product, uh, it, project is a bespoke design, design a new team structure, we're limited in our ability to gain efficiencies and improve performance. The focus of building products that leverage manufacturing, we can learn and build on our previous experience and continuous improvement happens because we get to find and measure each stage of the process. So in so doing, we also learn about our vulnerabilities because most, because most systems are sensitive to change. In a linear approach to design and construction, we've often missed the connection between our intent and impact. And while data is not the solution on its own, it empowers us to better analyze systems so we can efficiently test our cause and effect. Uh, so we can see here that we can either tip this tower over or, or keep it standing strong. Uh, the famous quote, you can't measure, manage what you don't measure has been used in business for decades. Architects and design professionals has, have sometimes resisted the se sentiment focusing on the qualitative aspects of design, which is still important. Uh, but this moment in history calls us to learn from other disciplines to address the uh, challenges of climate and affordability. And while this moment of disruption is challenging and even a bit daunting, I am hopeful because I know that we already have many of the solutions and we're growing in our ability to fully leverage them. Modular and prefabricated solutions were outside of the mainstream just a few years ago, but have been rapidly growing in momentum as part of the leaders such as this on this call really being able to think outside the box. Working on these challenging uh, challenges I know is easy to feel overwhelmed. And about a year ago when I was struggling, my husband who's a therapist <laughs> shared these images and asked me what I thought was the difference between the flood and a riverbed. I could see immediately that it was a boundary, the river edge. And thinking about recreating healthy systems, we need to start considering limits and constraints, not as a challenge to our thriving, thriving but essential to it. Okay, Lauren, go. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and um, um, I will be talking about the reduction of embodied carbon to data-driven product and building engineering. Um, and um, yeah, I want to start this with a little quote from uh, Johann Rockström, which should show up now. <laughs> I think we paused it. Yeah, what happens in the next 10 years? Um, yeah, basically, Johan Rockström from the Potsdam Institute for Climate, uh, climate Change Impact Research, um, he talks about like what is happening in the next 10 years. And, um, you know, our children have every reason to be alarmed. Finally, it's about stabilizing the planet. Uh, and we have a vision about uh, creating sustainable living for everyone. Um, and we will do this um, as we are designing buildings uh, as continuously evolving products, um, not just as buildings anymore. This is a change that we have here in Gropius. And that leads me to my question, um, why did I actually join Gropius? Uh, because Gropius is just not another construction company. Um, I can actually take influence on the whole life cycle of the of a building um, as, as we look at this at it as a product, and that is really inspiring, and um, that's why I joined. Um, with our first building, our prototype, we achieved a reduction of twenty two percent of embodied carbon compared to a reference uh, building of the DGNB. So we um, decreased from the DGNB value 9.4 kg CO2 equivalent per square meter in year to 7.35. But if we look at the whole life cycle, at the complete life cycle, we actually reduce much more because of our energy positive operations. Um, so, you know, those, those uh, circle diagrams, they only show half the truth because if you have energy positive buildings, you can even reduce more there. Um, but yeah, it's a prototype, and a prototype is an early release of a product built to test the concept or a process. With this, I don't want to say that or a, uh, a prototype would not be fully functional. No, it is fully, fun fully functional, but we have to think about um, how we look on things. We need to understand what exactly 
are our carbon targets and how can we achieve those in series? So we have to look at things in a really, really big picture. We don't have to look down on like, what are we doing per square meters? We have to understand that uh, from a global uh, level. <clears throat> how, do break, how do we break down those global emissions to a building? We have to break them down from global to national, to the sector, to the housing, and then also to the square meter. And only by looking at this like that, we will understand what we have to achieve in the next uh, couple of years. If we break this down for the uh, and look at the German uh, Climate Act, <clears throat> Germany uh, is to has to uh, be sixty has to reduce the carbon emissions sixty five percent to achieve um, the climate neutrality in twenty forty five. And um, until 2030, uh, we have to achieve the 65%. How we do we do this if we look at the embodied carbon at the, refer at the reference building of the DGMB, we have to get from 9.4 to 3.3, but we won't do this in one step. We have to take those steps in between. And um, it is also, again, we are not only talking about the embodied carbon, we also have to uh, keep in mind that we have to break down uh, the operational carbon as well. Um, so if we break this down, um, we um, can actually achieve more with climate positive operations. Um, we can achieve that we um, reduce more those than those 65% or those 65% over life cycle, or even be climate neutral over the complete life cycle of the building. And this is what we have to look for. This is really important, yeah. Um, how did we uh, look on the embodied carbon? We um, created a hotspot analysis to design out embodied carbon. And uh, surprisingly, it's like if, if you are that climate positive, um, the, the biggest part, the biggest share of the embodied carbon is the building technology. And because the buildings is, uh, are big, also the fire uh, resistancy. Um, how can we now bring this uh, process into um, uh, digital, uh, in the digital life cycle of a building, we have to digitalize um, related to sustainability. We call it deep sustainability meets deep tech. Um, in order to um, do this, we have to understand our processes. Um, first, we have to optimize the plot utilization. Um, then we have to um, end to end digital integrate uh, all our processes. We have to get a high efficient smart factory automata automation and integrate our on-site assembly as well. This leads to the platform-based building operating system that we use at Corpus, which we uh, actually uh, is, is on our own, that helps our um, residents to monitor and optimize uh, their operations. Uh, the benefits uh, go to the um, residents there. And this all leads to uh, ESG compliant buildings in Article 8 and 9, but also we uh, finally uh, can achieve a fully digital life cycle assessment, with, which is really important to have. We call that deep sustainability. If we want to do that, um, we um, really have to um, understand all the processes make the reality uh, clear, monitor the reality, harmonize those inform this information, and then also project it on the digital twin in order to um, ach achieve those sustainability insights. We first of all have to achieve climate, po climate positive operations is the lowest possible embodied carbon. And secondly, we have our deep tech will strive for optimization via carbon emissions towards deep sustainability. Thank you for it. Let's go. Let's do it. So, Polder. Polder is a name of this low lying area in the Netherlands. One third of the country is below sea level, and we've had to deal with this since the Middle Ages. We had to cooperate on water management through war, occupation, and other challenges. The year 2092, 
year I hold my two are my parents' age, 75. It goes without saying that the world will be a very different place by then. Here's a stunning but telling sunset in Bali where we live with our family at the moment. As you see my children from, as you have seen many children from other speakers today, I do think it is a lot to drive me forward. Why is no longer a question. There'll be a significant heat and water challenges as the climate is breaking down. It's obvious we will have to come together with a global ambitious consensus. Matt Damon figured it out in the movie, The Martian. Mars isn't our alternative. It's a pain to get back from that and to get there. We need to think of inclusive solutions and how we can generate this faster. Where will we live? The perseverance is being tested for its mission to Mars. As, as immense efforts and technolo technological advances made to reach its goals. It's just another example we can apply incredible technology efforts and huge teams across borders. And in this case, put an electric car on, the, on Mars. Universal, a long exposure NASA image from the International Space Station, showing the many cities on Earth melting together. Significance of the challenge ahead and the density of the challenge is obvious. The thin atmosphere shows the delicate situation and the urgency in starting to work together. The local levels need the refinement and adaption to create sometimes unique solutions. The image shows the Dutch Delta works an openable structure to allow a flow of tides. At times of storm, this nine kilometer structure can be closed to protect the land behind it and shows the immense collaboration to create such structures. The reality is, of course, that the next high tide is man-made and on global scale. Simply putting these kind of structures on a global level is out of the question. It will come with its own carbon footprint. So it's important we develop a strategy to work together and try to avoid this. The polder model, as we've called it, as I mentioned, one third of the country is below sea level and has dealt with this since the Middle Ages. It has had to cooperate on water management through war occupation and many other challenges. The collaboration framework was called the Polder Model, where everyone had to agree to survive. The Netherlands, by example, is framed by 22,000 kilometers of dike infrastructural systems, a timely and costly, costly process that, of course, requires immense investment to protect a city or a country from rising sea levels. What other frameworks for collaboration can we think of? Since the Middle Ages, different societies living in the same reclaimed border required to cooperate and share responsibility for maintenance of dikes and pumping stations. Typically, this was done through consensus and discussions to reach agreement. A lengthy process could take a lot of time, of course. So how to polder? Stephen Covey and Somaya Daben framed the three ways to collaborate. Defensive, compromise, synergize. How to pull it on a global scale or how to find a consensus fast. So perhaps it's time to listen and bring people together. Uh, DBF is much more than a flashy platform, of course. DBF aims to create consensus, as we learned so much from our key client, teaching us to operate in harmony through common goals and discussions. It is also fuel for us to change our story through our mission. We aim to push the discussion and the storyline of how we think about developing cities collaboratively. We build a platform to scale solutions faster similar to Stacey and many of the other speakers today, bringing together data and information on building design. One way is through the events and feedback that we started doing this year. The implementation solution, almost daily we navigate today and tomorrow's industry challenges. Not just in the design, but more and more so by looking at three scales in the building design stage, the city and context, the building and inner working, and what the building is made of. I want to do a big shout out to the team and Sajo and Tejas for being relentless in this push and drive forward in how we develop this book phone and to bring ourselves 
forward, as well as the building design teams and how we work with them. Always aiming to bring the best to our users and push for high quality projects or striving for meaningful solutions. So as we scale, not only with what we're doing, but also our ambition as a growing company, we know the challenges ahead are too large for anyone and many solutions need to be created. We wanted to thank everyone to inspire us today and push us forward to remain relentless pursuit. Here's some insights of how we tested and play as a team, just to show you what's going on inside the studio perhaps. We learned to work together as a young global team of almost 30 people, and now on average 12, 12 countries. We are on a mission to create scalable tools to let our community design better cities. And we invite people to be involved and to join our forces to rise above our current capabilities and challenges one another to evolve as we collaborate. Focus on synergies and common ground. We will evolve and drive positive change as we go forward. So I've learned a lot in the last few months, especially around this topic and teams and data. And this is one of the questions I've heard, I've had on my mind from quite early on. I would love to hear everyone's thought in it, uh, here in the chat or in the weeks to come through my email and how we will join forces to solve the challenges ahead. Feel free to reach me on my email, of course, Camille at digitalbluefarm.com. Okay, let's get to it. All right. So are we still living in a cowboy economy? In 1966, economist Kenneth Boulding referred to the cowboy economy as reckless and exploitive, similar to the way cowboys behaved in the Wild West during the 19th century, where they would settle somewhere, consume resources, and then move on. Boulding then goes to defend the spaceman economy against the cowboy economy. When up in space, astronauts can't throw away waste they generate. And moreover, every material is crucial for the crew's survival. So in other words, Boulding talks about a circular economy where resources are maintained within the system for um, as long as possible. So this phenomenon of a circular economy has been in our ancient history. For millennia, a robust reuse culture has existed within our society. Romans sorted trash in Pompeii, iron tools were refurbished from broken ceramics in the Persian Gulf, and in Athens, several buildings were built from a hodgepodge of recycled elements. Um, and, but why did this change in our post-industrial times? Must all buildings die? For the longest time, buildings have often been assumed to have a life, but then what of their death? When buildings die, they not only create a macroeconomic climatic tragedy, but also an environmental catastrophe. So going back to the words of Kenneth Boulding, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. So the building industry needs new models to reuse materials and accelerate towards this transition of the circular economy. So how do we give building materials a new life? How can we take forward these old age traditions of reuse, such as in this image of the triumphal arc of Constantine, which was built in 315, where elements were used from um, buildings of previous emperors. These, um, how can we reuse materials like this today? We need data, 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 they say. Information is key to understand where materials uh, are available, when they can be reused and where they're located. So AKA, we need building surveys. We need um, an inventory of these materials to understand their potential for reuse. Now, traditional building audits are generally carried out before a building is demolished, but uh, these are generally time consuming and difficult to scale. And more importantly, these building elements are retrieved at the very last minute when a building is demolished and it's not enough time for architects to be able to incorporate these reused elements in new designs. The McLean curve shows us this influence of early decision design making on project outcomes. The greater the investment in inf information gathering in the early design phases, the fewer the expensive changes that would need to occur at the latest stages of the project lifecycle. 
So what data do we have? Well, in the city of Zurich, um, we have a digital strategy that recognizes open and accessible data, which is paramount for a digital economy. So we have the year of construction, the number of floors or the volume of the building, which is made openly accessible, but we still don't really have information on materials in existing buildings. So then the question is, how can we data mine the city for this material information? Recent advances in Google Street View provide us 360 panoramic imagery of our streets and surroundings at a global scale. Google Street View imparts both spatial and temporal information that um, can help us understand which materials can be reused. Historically, the construction industry has ignored these kinds of data sets because they've been overwhelming to process and draw conclusions from just because of the complexity of data analysis and management. But with recent advances in machine learning, we're now able to process uh, these kinds of unstructured data sets. We can use machine learning for various types of material recognition. We can classify a building facade, identify whether it's a brick facade or not. We can identify windows using bounding boxes, or we could identify the pixel locations of different uh, materials to then further calculate their um, existing material intensities. Our planet is a complex geolocated marketplace, and we need to rethink our circular design paradigms and challenge the way we, uh, re we re look at the end of life of buildings. We need to shift from this exploitive ideology to a more restorative one. And now that we've talked about data quite a bit, um, I, I wanted to talk, to talk about this quote by Jay Brer. We are surrounded by data, but we are starved of insights. So we have to actively engage with these massive data sets to extract knowledge from them, to deploy circular strategies. And as an example, here you can see, um, once we detect whether it's a brick facade or not, we can then come up with early estimations of whether of the material recovery pathways. Um, we can understand whether we can directly reuse the materials or if they need some kind of treatment or processing, or if it needs to be turned into a secondary utility using recycling. So then the question is, can we create a resource map of the city using this information? Uh, this temporal and spatial data can help facilitate local reuse practices and can also act as a de design agency to critically assess material lifespans. And this sort of early identification can help bring about an extended time period between uh, the end of life of one building and the start of another. So this time buffer allows for the matching of components that are available for sale. And it also reduces the amount of storage time uh, that these materials would be, uh, that these materials would require. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had this real, uh, this data in real time though? Um, so this idea of digital twins, where we have the real-time digital counterpart of buildings has been gaining momentum in the last few years. And such real-time data could also help us monitor our buildings better for repair and use. And now I'd like to end by just saying that data has been compared to oil and gold and such as its value to the global economy. But now they say data is like water. It needs to be accessible and clean. So my question to you is, how do you think data in, to in, uh, data pipelines can be used to achieve a spaceship economy? Hi, my name is Patrick and I want to tell you how to cut embodied carbon in structures. I'm a structural engineer and we have a huge responsibility, but also a big positive impact if you make things better. Why? Because we are the largest user of materials in all industry. So let's start our journey into circular structural design. In March 2020, the European Commission drafted the circular economy package in the context of the EU taxonomy. Hereby, ambitious goals for the use of reused components, recycled materials, and sustainable renewable materials are defined. This will become active in 2023. And if the project shall be classified as sustainable, then that has to be fulfilled these rules. In the past, the focus was on the evaluation of operational energy use and its related costs. Nowadays, with issues like CO2 tax, the embedded carbon are getting increasingly more important and also relevant in various sustainability certification systems, such as DGNB in Germany or BREEAM in the UK. While energy delivered by the sun is in practice available unlimited, 
natural resources such as ore or sand for building materials like steel or concrete are limited and becoming more and more scarce. This leads to increasing material prices and the possibility of reusing components or materials and alternative building materials becomes more and more important. Just three weeks ago, I attended the Expo Real in Munich, a large real estate trade fair, and more or less every exhibition booth had some kind of logo or link to ESG criteria, environment, social, and governments. I think taking over this responsibility is not only important to attract clients, but also attract future employees. There are many scientific, societal, and political initiatives which define the framework for our activities. Paris Climate Agreement, the European Bauhaus, IPPC reports, the EU taxonomy, and of course, the SDGs by the United Nations. They and many more will be an important driver to push our joint activities towards a better future. But reality looks like this. Lack of time in the planning process, cutting costs at the wrong ends, missing collaboration between different stakeholders in the industry leads to a lot of over-design of structural elements. Here I see a huge potential to reduce mass and embodied energy, which should be used in the future. I'm convinced that the concept of a circular economy can help us a lot to develop better solutions for the future. On the one side is the biological cycle, but I want to start with the technical one, mainly by reusing structural elements in the future. It is about recycling, refurbishing, reusing, and many more. This is my favorite circular structural design project. It is Eindhoven train station where I pass by regularly. Here the roof is made out of steel trusses from military bridges from the Second World War. They were not used afterwards and then implemented into the roof. At that time, nobody called it circular structural design, but actually it was. Even if, if the idea of reuse is not new, today construction industry is responsible for the largest amount of waste of all industries all over the world. But there are many possibilities to improve this. That is why I'm not only practicing, but also working in academia to bring things forward. Now I want to share some research projects with you. Recreate is an EU funded project with partners from the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, Croatia, and led by Finland. The goal is to explore the potential reuse of precast concrete elements. Here we study the full process and value change of the project, which will end in four pilot projects in the year 2025. Starting from the deconstruction process, we are also doing the quality management, the assessment of the current state of the materials and components, develop logistic concepts, preparing an inventory of the available elements, as well as a full life cycle assessment and inventing new business models to make it viable in the future. But for me as a structural designer, the most interesting part is then the actual design of the new structure and building because this process is upside down compared to the traditional one. Instead of making elements to measure to fit the design, we have to work with predefined elements and organize them in a way to suit the new design requirements. Here you can see the results from the first pilot project from our Swedish partners, which was shown at the Expo 2022 in Helsingborg, Sweden. Obviously it looks different to traditional pavilion designs, but great to see that it actually happens and that the pilot projects in the Netherlands, Germany, and Finland will follow soon. Let's move on with the biological circle. Here, obviously, timber plays an important role, but it's not the only possible material for structural elements. At Eindhoven University, we started the research about bio-based composite materials using hemp and flax fibers in combination with uh, bio-based resins some years ago. In 2016, we could realize the first bio-based composite bridge on the campus of the university, which was a great achievement with TU Delft, University of Applied Sciences, Breda, and NPSP as industrial partner. The bridge has a span of 14 meters and can carry load of 500 kilograms per square meter. The bridge stayed there for five years and now is back in our lab for some more future research and testing. Based on that, in 2020, we could start a large European Interreg project 
with partners from Netherlands, Germany, France, and Belgium. And in that context, we design and realize three more bridges in Almere this year, and in Ulm, and bergen op Zoom in the Netherlands uh, next year again. Of course, we did intensive analysis with our PhD students and testing in the lab. But in addition, the authorities also requested a full-scale load test with 500 kilograms per square meter, according to the Euro code. Of course, the bridge passed the test, but also the predicted strains and deformations of the structure match very well with rea re reality. In April this year, we could install the bridge in Almere, where the, over the summer the Floriade, an international garden exhibition, took place, and many visitors could walk over the bridge. In the meantime, we are in the middle of the design process of the bridge in Ulm and looking forward to its uh, implementation in spring 2023. I hope I could give you a brief overview of what we mean with circular structural design. On the one hand side, we can try to reuse materials, building components, and whole buildings. But of course, we can also explore new materials such as bio based composites. So let's achieve truly innovative, sustainable solutions for the future. Thank you. Um, so our first panelist is Chris Anderson, who's the founder and CEO of Vantum Global. He heads the team that develops and implements the Vantum system. Chris is a serial entrepreneur focusing on creative, innovative, sustainable solutions with a global footprint. Prior to Vantum, he co-founded and headed for 20 years an international construction products manufacturing business that was a pioneer in the use of sustainably harvested timber. The company grew to 1,600 employees with operations in six countries. Chris grew up in South Africa and the United States, where he has a broad international network. He has a multilingual, multicultural life and family that he attributes as an important source of his success. He is a BS from Park College and a master's study in international relations at the University of South Carolina. Welcome, Chris. Our second panelist is Ife Weaver, who's a professor in architecture and a chair of research in architecture at Belfast School of Architecture in Bath, United Kingdom. Ife received her PhD from the University of Cambridge at the Department of Architecture and is a lifetime member of the Darwin College and associate of Cambridge Architectural Research Limited. She has worked and practiced in UK, Ireland, and Hong Kong, Malaysia, the Bahamas, and has finally returned to the UK after working for a decade at the Research Center for Zero Emission Neighborhoods and Smart Cities in uh, NTENU in Trondheim, Norway, which she continues to be affiliated with. She is one of the founding partners of Norway Singapore collaboration established in 2017 to facilitate research collaboration between acad academia and industry. Welcome, Ethan. Our third panelist is Franco Piva, who's the founder and director of Ergodamus Timber Engineering in Trento, Italy. Ergodamus is a consultancy office specialized in the design, engineering of timber structures, building physics, shop drawings, bin production, and assembly drawings to the CNC machine. He works internationally with builders and manufacturers and develops and designs uh, ex and has extensive experience in the field of timber building design with different construction systems. Franco has written three books and two words to decide, describe Franco's work are creative, creativity and design for manufacturing. Welcome Franco. And our final panelist is Will Arnold, head of climate action at the Institution of Structural Engineers in London. Will is a structural engineer with a focus on decarbonization of the construction industry. He is a passionate about helping the construction sector maximize its positive impact on people, places, and the planet. Will is a fellow of the institution and sits on the institution's climate emergency task group, as well as being a member of a number of other industry steering groups, including the UK Net Zero Carbon Building Standard, the UK Green Building Pencil, Council's whole life carbon net zero roadmap and the RICS led built environment carbon database initiative. Welcome, Will. Take away, Chris. Well, thank you. We, we should have some trumpets since this is a yeah. call to action. <laughs> but anyway, this is a quote I like and, and uh, apropos to what we're talking about. Uh, it's aimed more at the petroleum and carbon economy, but it really applies to construction because we're in desperate need of a transition uh, to better solutions. Uh, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. We transitioned to a better solution. 
so one of the main reasons we need uh, a better solution is that we've got uh, a, a real challenge. Uh, we need to build more affordable housing globally, and we also need to uh, reduce energy use because of the climate crisis. Um, those are mutually exclusive usually because of the green premium. The more energy efficient a structure is, uh, the more it costs. One of the main problems is that the traditional construction is very complicated. On the left, you see what we do mostly internationally. To the right, we'll recognize what we do in the US. Very complex systems, lots of parts, lots, lots of labor, lots of waste, and not very productive at all. This graph summarizes that. The red line there that's flat over the last 30 years, no productivity gain, hardly at all. Whereas the blue line shows you the productivity gains in the general manufacturing sector, you know, where new materials like carbon fibers and graphene have been uh, implemented and whole industries have been transformed, like, you know, electrical cars. The result in our industry is affordable, uh, how, uh, affordable housing has decreased, costs have completely increased. You look here over the last 20 years, uh, uh, housing costs globally have increased by 70% which has left, uh, and, and incomes have not caught up, have not maintained that same pace. Um, the energy challenge portion of this is also acute. The traditional uh, construction is not energy efficient. Brick and mortar has a very low, low R value. Um, frame building, as we do in the U.S. a lot, has a thermal bridges. The, the, the studs uh, 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 provide thermal bridging, and you have a lot of air leakage. And then this is magnified by what is being called the cooling crunch. So here, some of the most rapidly growing countries in the world are the exactly the countries that have the highest number of days where air conditioning is likely to be needed because they, those are the hot days. And you can see this on this graph. Uh, these are the countries where uh, this is energy consumption in most of these countries. So you've had a a doubling of uh, the uh, of, of air conditioning use in these developing economies, whereas in the more developed economies, energy use in, 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 in air conditioning is flat. So don't be afraid to take big steps when one is indicated. You can't cross a chasm with two small jumps. We need revolutionary innovation. We, we can't continue on with very small incremental uh, uh, innovations and expect to, to yield the types of results. And, and you know, I liken it to, kind of some of the original ideas for uh, revolutionizing agriculture, you know, the designs for a four-legged mechanical horse, right? Just little incremental changes, doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't see a lot of mechanical horses, we see tractors, which completely changed the way that agriculture was done at the time. And so, you know, here's some pictures of what, what you know, we're doing. Um, we're trying to automate these complex systems, right? We're putting in uh, robotics to cut a bunch of parts. We're trying to put them together with robotics. We've got a bunch of layers still. This is really expensive, um, very, uh, uh, really expensive and, and not that effective. Um, and I think this quote from Bill Gates really um, summarizes the problem. Automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify efficiencies. Automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. I fear that we are magnifying overall the inefficiencies in the construction systems. What we've done at Vantum is to rethink the, the system completely, replacing all that complexity that we talked about with a simple structural panel, three parts, a complete insulation layer in the middle that has no thermal bridging, uh, a special ceramic facing on both sides that uh, does not require additional cladding uh, because it is completely weather resistant and structural. What we do is we apply that panel to the floor, the walls, the, the, uh, the roof to modular volumetric structures. So we end up with this beautiful airtight, very structural envelope, kind of like an ice cooler, uh, which we produce uh, in, in offsite construction as a volumetric modular unit on uh, something that looks like automotive production lines. These are delivered to the job site about 80% complete, meaning everything's in there. The, 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 the electrical, the plumbing, the flooring, even the furniture. Um, the only thing that is still done on site is, is the uh, usually the foundations and a little bit of stitch up. This is a, a project we recently completed in South America. <clears throat> now, for this to be globally applicable and applicable to our times, um, any solutions gotta be 
resilient, climate resilient. And so we made a very strong focus on this and, and I'm proud to, to have homes that have been through Hurricane Dorian, the strongest hurricane in, on record with no problems, 8.2 magnitude earthquakes, and the product is fire resistant. So this simplicity payoff, what is it? Well, in our case, we've been able to lower cost against traditional construction by 20%. Um, we have an envelope that is 70% more energy efficient, and that translates to, on say a 2,000 square foot home, about 40 tons of CO2 saved per year, or 2,000 over 2,000 tons over 50 years. Um, our long-term goal is to reach half a gigaton CO2 reduction annually. Uh, for this, we've partnered with Breakthrough Energy, uh, Bill Gates's fund for for carbon reduction. This will mean that we look to build 250,000 homes globally. Uh, uh, to, to reach this goal. And so what we're trying to do is back to the earlier slide, we are trying to get rid of that, in, that, that, that green premium. That's what Vantum does. That's what this rethinking of the system does so that we're able to lower costs and lower the energy use at the same time and to do it in a way that's globally applicable for volume. So uh, another quote by our, our new good friend, uh, we need to accomplish something gigantic. We have never done this before. We have to do it much faster than we've ever done anything similar. That's the call to action right there. So thank you very much. Take it away. Okay. So thank you for this uh, invitation. It's great to be part of this uh, panel. So I just want to begin by saying recent IPCC report stresses that to remain within 1.5 degrees, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by almost 50% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. And so the, a climate emergency has been declared. So the need for addressing uh, whole life emissions towards net zero is emphasized in many schemes worldwide, whereas it's leading to a confusing plethora of terms and um, definitions. So to address this confusing plethora, we in the IEA Annex 72 have conducted an international survey of net zero schemes in 35 countries worldwide. What we see is that energy is still the primary metric in 60% of those schemes, yet 40% have now shifted to greenhouse gas emissions. So I just want to um, share with you some of our experience from the Research Centre um, for uh, Zero Emission Neighbourhoods and Smart Cities. So basically a Norwegian approach to achieving a national goal to achieve net zero. So the vision of the Zen Centre is to create building and neighbourhoods with zero greenhouse gas emissions. So effectively, emissions from renewable production must balance embodied emissions and operational emissions across the whole life cycle of the building. So <clears throat> a net zero energy building produces the same amount of energy as its demand. So the green balances the red shown in the graph. A net zero emission building balances the balance is measured in terms of greenhouse gas emissions across the whole lifetime of the building. So it's including the blue part embodied emissions. In recognition that we're not all at the same scale, um, that went very fast, um, that we created the ZEB ambition levels um, to across the whole life cycle of um, uh, the building. So it goes from the lowest, which is a balance for operational emissions, and um, right through to the end of life. So in terms of uh, developing our Z pilot projects, we also have developed um, a stepwise approach based on Trias Energetica. Uh, but the key emphasis is always on passive design strategies, reducing energy efficiency, as low as possible, and then balancing that with renewable technologies. So the importance of including embodied emissions is actually found in the results from our Z pilots. So we have nine pilots which are built, and what you can see here is the orange is the operational emissions, and grey is the embodied emissions from materials. So we see a 70-30 split. 
And another interesting finding was that across all the Zs, uh, we see that the key driver for high emissions was the PV, the concrete and the insulation used. Um, but obviously, as a designer, you, you need to make a view on uh, you need the PV, but you can reduce emissions across the other materials. And um, another important fact was the, that we needed to use dynamic emission factors for the grid mix, because even though Norway is almost net zero um, emissions for the grid, uh, there's considerable export and import across countries, and we need to consider the future decarbonization of the grid mix. So basically that slide is showing, you know, basically we need to include and um, consider the export and import of, of uh, electricity in and out of the country, right through to Europe and back in again, which is higher carbon um, and the future decarbonization of the uh, grid. So we use a ZEB emission factor. So how do we bridge this gap between design and research? So we need to really find ways uh, to use technology and to integrate um, you know, uh, robust uh, calculation methodologies into the design tools. So over um, actually 10 years ago, I can't believe it now, um, uh, I started with this development of an Excel-based embodied emissions tool. This is just showing uh, version one of it. Um, but this was really useful for us, instead of having a black box approach, um, having the Excel allowed us the flexibility, Whoop. wow, okay, and <laughs> um, so, okay, um, the point with the Excel tool was it uh, became the Z tool, which was then used to assess the performance of uh, the Z pilots. Then we started to look at how we could dynamically connect that to um, 3D tools using scripting, and we also included um, EPDs and generic data. So I'm showing a series of slides here that show um, the evolution of this. So this is one uh, early stage concept where we connected uh, Revit BIM to the XZ tool using Dynamo scripting and explored the use of color uh, to communicate to designers about high and low emissions. The second stage was actually starting to work with a dashboard, so the user interface. Um, because for architects and designers, the scripting part is quite difficult. So the idea was keep the engine in the bonnet, under the bonnet, but work with that interface um, side of it. And, and we also, again, like I said, started to work with uh, the use of sliders which were connected to um, an EPD in the engine, let's say, but you could easily change the form of um, the building blocks and also look at the impact on embodied missions of um, different uh, locations of materials and how you show the impact for the um, transport missions. Then um, I really started to think about, well, how do we cope with that shift in scale from building to neighborhood and also the complexity with um, multiple KPIs and how do we communicate to diverse stakeholders? So in these two um, projects here, we started to look at the integrating uh, virtual reality um, to engage diverse stakeholders. And here you're seeing a dashboard approach where we can um, easily through the click of a button shift from uh, building scale and um, right through the bottom left is showing you neighborhood scale. Um, so I currently have um, a PhD researcher who is working with uh, immersive technologies connected uh, to, three, to that engine that I spoke about before. Um, and we're really um, quite excited about this work um, to communicate to diverse stakeholders. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ife. Cool. Good job. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me to this panel. I'm very happy to, to be here and excited to be, be here. Oh. Okay. As uh, the other speaker said, uh, we building industry, we have to face some uh, challenges, and so we have to choose, as in the movie matrix, digitization and de to decarbonize the industry or let it uh, slide. It is up to us, but in my opinion, timber is a must be part of the solution. Uh, timber is a kind of a new material for the building industry, 
but uh, um, we have to find new ways to use uh, to make timber the most cost-effective solution to go for. And the reason is very simple. Uh, is the world asking this, asking for this? So we need to go for more sustainable materials. We need to store CO2 or to reduce the CO2 emission instead of uh, emitting CO2 as other materials uh, does. I'm not saying to get rid of steel and concrete. I'm more saying to use the materials in a wiser way. The industry, the timber industry is already there. And this diagram shows uh, how the CLT production, the global CLT production is skyrocketing all over the world. We expect uh, to produce almost 3 million of cubic meter of CLT by 2023. So, why are we not using this material? Why are developers and builders not using this material, uh, having him it as a main material? The main uh, reason, one of the main reasons is the cost of the material. And so timber engineers are able to value engineer the project uh, and to reduce the cost. As in this example, we reduce by 50, more than 50 panels, the numbers of, pan of CLT panels to install, and we saved, we helped the developer to save more than one week per floor. The way we uh, work is to implement, uh, to strongly implement a digital model in our workflow. Other speakers spoke about the digital twin, but we are already there. The industry is already there and is already using uh, the digital uh, model. In a holistic way, we need to, to do this. We need to implement the digital model to de-risk the projects and to foresee all the problems uh, we could have uh, on site. Um, timber is a very flexible material. Let's say we can use it in many, many different ways, but people are quite skeptical when we, uh, when we speak about uh, this material. So the digital model allows you to receive a 3D model weeks before having the material on site and you can deeply analyze the model. You can just click on an element and you see who that element is, how big it is, how tall it is, how heavy it is. And once you receive the material on site, you will say, wow, this is what draw is what you get. I saw this on my monitor, I received this component on site. It doesn't matter the complexity, no matter how complex it is, because there will be a CNC machine working for you and uh, uh, making the, uh, that's the, that component to assembly on site. So we always try and we need to value in the broad to work more off site and to reduce the time on site. So on site, we expect to assemble just uh, a list of components, prefabricated components. All this is, can be called the design for manufacturing and assembly. DFMA is definitely one of my favorite acronym in the building industry. And I see DFMA as the new value engineering tool. Without this, concept, without this approach, we cannot value engineer any project. Thanks to DFMA, we can see in advance how this, the, yes. robo the robots we work in the factory and we can see if they, um, if they, there are some warnings, if uh, everything is okay, or if something is a bit uh, uh, incorrect or to, to, to solve many problems. In this way, I like to use again, these uh, things of uh, the movie Matrix. We see our model, we see our world as an endless sequence of digital numbers. Uh, for you, it is a beam, but for us as timber engineers, it's just a sequence, an endless sequence of numbers and letters. DFMA approach or something similar was used even in the 1969 uh, when uh, the first man landed on the moon. They had to foresee every single problem. They had to foresee every, uh, every possibility. So they, they had to work in a very precise way. They didn't have the computer, but they had a brain to use. In this manner, using the DFMA has we managed Many we are managing many different projects all over the world just by sharing the digital files with our clients. Of course, when we work in countries like in Australia, we need to take care 
to take into consideration how the elements will be uh, loaded in the container, how they will be transported. We cannot ask to have a container five centimeters longer, one inch longer. That is the standard size and we have to, to keep it in mind. Uh, I'm not saying that we need just to make standard homes. I'm not saying to build, uh, to have just black homes as Henry Ford uh, did uh, uh, 100, more than 100 years ago. He on the way to solve the problem at that time to build for the. I am more saying this case to take inspirations from the they prefabricate modules, they prefabricate elements, and they assemble those elements on site in the factory, uh, sorry, on, in the factory, in the shipyard. In that way, they reduce a lot of the time to assemble it. So, um, they, this is what they say in China, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And I hope we will not plant this tree on Mars. We have just <laughs> one planet and we can save it. All right. Well, thank you for the invite. And um, amazing to sort of build on such a plethora of great information from so many other speakers this afternoon. Really, really nice to be able to go at the end and sort of try and wrap everything up. I work for the Institution of Structural Engineers. We're an international membership organisation. We have about 30,000 members around the world. And my job for the last three years has been to try and put sustainability at the heart of what they do. Um, you're going to have seen lots of these slides already today, in effect, but this is a reminder of the magnitude of the problem. Um, our emissions have been going up every year since we learned how to get fossil fuels out of the ground. They're not showing any signs of turning around. We need to do something really dramatic. Um, that means getting onto that green line going down. That's not a chipping away at the edge thing. That, that's something much bigger than this. And, and the reason we need to do this as a reminder is that when people make predictions for the year 2100, about what's going to happen to life on this earth, they're referring to the lives of our children who are alive today. So my nephew, Bobby, who's now two, will be 80 in the year 2100, which is not that old. So these are real things happening to real people. Um, I'm only, you know, really going to talk about body carbon. We've mostly talked about body carbon today. We need to bear in mind this is part of a bigger system wide issue of problems. Um, and we do need to ask ourselves what we can do about the wider system. Um, but as a structural engineer and as building designers, you know, one of your biggest impacts will be on embodied carbon. So it's a pretty good place to start. I don't really need to go into this slide. I think by now you know what embodied carbon is and what it means. Um, the only thing I would say on this, of course, is that, you know, different projects will present different overall low whole life carbon solutions. And we need to treat each project individually. There's no one size fits all. And sometimes the operational carbon will be the bigger piece of the pie. You probably know these numbers already, uh, nearly 40% of global energy related carbon emissions are due to buildings and construction. Um, and specifically within that, embodied carbon um, makes up this really big chunk. So embodied carbon's somewhere between, I actually think 10 to 20% of global emissions, construction steel plus cement, that alone gets you up to just over 10%. Bricks is another two or three. You're not even looking at glass and aluminium. So at that point. And the reason why I think embodied carbon is the most important aspect of carbon we need to be talking about today is because once it's in the atmosphere, you can't get it out. This is a graph of yearly emissions on a project um, uh, where the construction emissions, the upfront carbon emissions are only 40% of the total. But you see that it's the biggest block on this chart. And once it's in the atmosphere, you can't get it back out very easily. So you kind of get one chance to do this embodied carbon thing, and then it's gone. Those mistakes have been made. In terms of scale, in terms of numbers, and we've seen a few numbers today, the, the, uh, the thing I always like to point out to people is that when this uh, Amazon distribution warehouse was built uh, over in the UK, about 5,000 tonnes of carbon were emitted during the design of the steel frame, so the construction of the steel frame. 5,000 tonnes just the steel frame, that doesn't include the foundations, the ground slab, or anything like that. So if we could have done that 20% better, we could have saved 1,000 tonnes. When you compare that to a cross-Atlantic flight, um, which you choose to get on or not get on, that decision is worth one ton. And we have decisions in front of us that are worth thousands. And so, you know, the, the only thing you really should remember out of all 20 of my slides is probably this one. And it's that orders of magnitude difference of impact that we can make. We've seen this equation a few times today. Um, what I want to sort of talk about and touch on is the fact that we need to be reducing both sides of this equation. 
quantity of materials as well as the carbon factors related to those materials. There's no point just doing one side or the other with this. Yes, they multiply, but you won't get to the end result fast enough. Think back to that graph at the start. Um, at the institution, we've built tools to help our engineers with this. Actually, these are available to anyone who wants them. If you go onto our website, you can get hold of this guide on the left and this free Excel tool on the right. It'll do those carbon calculations for you. you it's, it's open source. You can plug it into your own software, into Rhino and things like that if you want to as well. We've had some really good feedback on the use of it. Um, but what people end up using it for, and going back to this thing about both sides of the equation, is they typically end up using it to reduce the amount of stuff that they use on a project. Use less stuff has become a sort of mantra of mine over the last few years. That's the bit that's in your control as a designer. The specification of a material really isn't, and I'm going to touch on why in just a second, but it's mostly about use less stuff is how I'm going to drive carbon down today. On materials, yes, you can go on some very nice looking websites and you can be sold some low carbon steels and some low carbon concretes today. The problem is the stuff you can pour in the ground and get onto your site isn't really that low carbon at all. Um, it uses scrap steel and it uses cement replacements, both of which are pretty much fully utilized around the world already. So if you buy it for your site, somebody else just gets less on theirs, but they don't know about it. Global emissions don't change. And the really innovative stuff, such as these on the right, which is really exciting and cool, they're only available at the size of a balloon, the size of a bar of soap right now. Thankfully, their marketing teams have put some things in for context for us. So you can't really use these to build a billing out of just yet. They're a bit around the corner, a little bit away from today. If we go back to that magnitude of the problem graph, what you then realize is that because of how far off these material decarbonization savings are, the second half of the equation, you realize there's, there's this lag bringing it in. That's going to take time. Therefore, the only way you're going to start plummeting emissions downhill is if we use materials more efficiently today. That's the role as a designer. That's why you can't just be waiting for material decarbonization to, to sort of save us. Um, and that means doing things like this. It means reusing what we've got. Um, this was a, this is a 30 story office building in central London and the designers proved that by reusing it and even with sticking an extension on the side and on the roof, they still halved the carbon footprint of the building. They've saved something like 13,000 tons of carbon through that decision, which is a, you know, game changing amount of money. And when we designed these two skyscrapers, one in somewhere with just a bit of wind loading, but it's the one on the right in somewhere with huge earthquakes and huge typhoon storms. Um, we were able to use the same amount of steel in both. And the reason why is that the one on the right was driven by structural efficiency. If you're designing things based around structural efficiency and then you wrap them in beautiful architecture instead of the other way around, you start to drive down carbon. There's questions all over every building we should be asking today as to why we've made the decisions that we have done. And the business as usual answer to those questions is not going to get us out of this problem. So all of, the, all of these questions on the screen, you should go away and ask this on your own problem and use that to try and find that thousand tons of carbon. And if you're not doing it yet, um, you probably are because you're on this call, um, but you will have to be doing it pretty soon if you're not. In the UK, there will be legislation on this before we, before we know it. Part Z, which is a proposal on the left, is the industry calling for such legislation. And the standard on the right is what we're doing in the meantime to enable developers to go and effectively meet the legislation before it's here. So to sort of wrap up today, a reminder that we need to take responsibility for our work emissions and that huge order of magnitude difference. We need to be looking for a thousand tons of carbon on every project. And we need to do this by fundamentally using less stuff if we're a designer. And if you've got money, accelerating material R&D at the same time. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe a couple of questions to the panel. Uh, or just let me check. Okay, we have a great question from uh, James Esquivel, who asks, are we measuring the lifespan and durability of our creations with lower carbon as compared to past construction methods? Maybe a question to Will or Franco or Ife or Chris, feel free to jump in. I think that there's a lot we can learn from past construction methods. And you know, what, what fossil fuels have done is they've made humanity lazy. They've enabled <laughs> us to do things quickly without having to worry too much about, you know, well, we didn't have to worry too much about impacts. Um, you know, you could build the pyramids now a lot quicker than we did back in the day and you'd emit a lot more carbon in the process. So there's a huge amount we can learn from vernacular architecture, both in terms of embodied and operational carbon. We built a university in the south of Rwanda a few years ago, and, and it's going to be carbon negative by the time we get into the mid 2030s um, through the sort of tree planting that went on site. But the only way you could even get close to that was to build everything out of earth walls, timber roofs, and stuff like that. You, you know, we, we have to go back to these old methods. 
absolutely. Since I'm a big uh, timber nerd, as I like to find <laughs> myself, I think we we sh we have a lot to learn uh, from uh, how they used uh, sustainable materials, how they used uh, timber in the past uh, centuries. So yeah, for sure we can uh, we can learn a lot. I like to hike in the mountain to, and uh, see how they built. Uh, I live in the Alps, so I see how they built uh, 400, 300 years old uh, buildings, and I learn a lot from them uh, about uh, technology somehow. So, yeah. Great answer. Okay, one, maybe one last question for the panel by Anonymous. The term carbon neutral is tossed around. To what extent should carbon offsetting be eligible for classifying a structure as net zero? If I, if I can jump in again, yeah. we, we have to be careful with how we define net zero and actually most sort of globally recognized definitions will require you to meet some form of targets first before you offset. So it's not simply about balancing what we emit uh, with how we offset against it, but you actually have to reduce emissions in the first place. Um, so, you know, I, offsets do have a place and, and that's effectively you pay money for somebody else to reduce their emissions um, using a sort of proven technology typically. Um, they, there are offsets where you can plant trees and so on and so forth, but you know the the, the amount of time it takes for that to impact takes a long time. But they're not going to save us. You, know, you need to plant a forest the size of Russia plus North America to 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 offset on the scale that we need. Um, so that, I think they've got a place. I think if you're going to do it, you do it right, and there's recognised rules for how you go about offsetting. But you absolutely have to drive down emissions first if you actually want to stand any chance of getting global, you know, the global situation under control. Thank you, Will. So thank you, Chris, Ife, Franco, and Will. And so now, now we move to the final part of the uh, event, which is to, to close the event. I would just welcome the speakers, all the speakers, uh, just to share their final thoughts. Um, if you're still with us, thank you for everyone who's sticking, sticking to the end. Um, and so uh, over the past three hours, we've had a really effective multi-perspective discussion about building carbon, its challenges and opportunities for existing and future cities. And so just thank you again to all the panelists. I think, I think it's very hard to wrap up a kind of uh, conclusion at this point because there's a lot of information and a lot of things to think about. Um, so we'd just like to thank everyone. And thank you again to the audience for sharing your questions. If we were unable to get your questions, we'll, we'll try to answer that after the event and share it. And so, uh, Camille, are you there? I'm here. Okay, so now I'll just turn it over to Camille, who just will tell us what happens next and how you can get access to these outcomes and how we can continue the conversation. Um, so some of the next steps will be that we will follow up in the next uh, days with shorter uh, videos. And then in the time to come, we'll follow out with a full video. Um, we'll be taking some of the questions on LinkedIn, on the chat here in the email, and we'll compile those and we'll get back to everyone, um, either through the mailing list or a combination of LinkedIn and other media. Um, what we'd like to do is to explore uh, a further collaboration. And I think there's been so much information today and the last two hours and what I think is a really energetic event, uh, super exciting and I think just really dense. So I think we're gonna unpack that a little bit in the time to come. And maybe we set something out for the next one to three months and we decide how we can go from here. But I think it's been really fascinating to see how the angles of attack on this issue has been from either structure, components, design and data. And I think that really addresses a lot of different things that we need to do probably together in a better way even. Um, and I think that we great to, to to develop more bridges. And I would like to think in collaboration terms. Um, so I think we'll be reaching out in a time to come, agile to the panelists and people that join in on the call, as well as on our LinkedIn community and people that have been part of this uh, journey. Um, did I catch it all, Sergio? Yeah, that was that was that was beautiful. <laughs> So thanks everyone. Uh, and I think with that, we can close the event and we hope to see you soon. Super. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Fantastic. Thanks for organizing. Super Just exciting. Good. Thank you, Julie, okay, thank Sigel, you. CBF you. team. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. bye. Bye.